It's premiere week, and the APP Tour family welcomes you to APP TV. Hey everybody, welcome to the APP Academy. I'm Coach Dominic Catalano. I'm joined today by none other than head pro Sarah Ansbury. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. So what are we going to be going over today, Sarah? Well, I'm thinking we might as well work on a little bit of third shot drop slash third shot drive action. That sounds awesome to me. So guys, don't go far. We're going to take a quick break here from our sponsors. We'll be right back on court with Sarah Ansbury. About a year ago, I traveled to this tournament and the temperatures were over 100 degrees. It just hit the wall. The ref comes over and like, what's going on? I go, I don't know. I, I don't know, feel good. I got escorted over to the ambulance and I got to get hooked up on an IV. It was really scary. I started taking Berrylicious Electrolyte Supreme. It gets me through all day tournaments. And it's really important to keep hydrating because ambulances are no fun. So pay attention to your body and stay hydrated. All right, we are here on court now with Sarah Ansbury. She is going to go over, what are you going to go over right now? We're going to actually uh, work a little bit on some disguising of your third shots, like when you should drop it, when you should drive it, and what kind of the difference is, and uh, specifically looking at more of like your basic topspin drop shot. Awesome, awesome. Well, why don't you give us a little demonstration of what you want to go over right now? So one of the things where a lot of people think is kind of a cool thing in pickleball, what I think is really cool in pickleball, is the disguise factor. And one of the common things you see when someone's about to drive the ball, you see a big wind up and you just you can tell, okay, now they're going to rip one at you. Hey, it's kind of obvious when someone's going to drop it because they're going down low and kind of softening it. And it usually has a lot to do with the backhand, uh, the back swing, I'm sorry. So when you're hitting a third shot drop or a third shot drive, they can very much look the same. And ideally making it look uh, more similar gives you more options with directionality um, and consistency on that shot. So um, when we're talking about that motion, a lot of people, especially racket sports players, think a topspin motion always has to look like the classic shaping of the ball over. Right. Well, when you're talking about topspin, it's really basically low to high. So when you're looking at um, hitting a consistent third shot drop, a lot of the inconsistencies come from going over the ball with your paddle. I mean, mm -hmm. we're in Florida right now, so right. it's pretty humid most of the year. Yeah. But let's talk about West Coast, California. It's a very different ball. So humidity might change how you have to hit the ball. So right. to make it a lot more consistent, what we're essentially looking at is coming from a more low to high position where you're keeping your paddle face more open, so you're more likely to get that ball over the net on a regular basis, less uh, likelihood of hitting the ball in the net. And essentially the difference between a drop and a drive is gonna be swing speed. How fast are we swinging? So when you're kind of prepping, one of the most important things actually is how you hold your paddle. Mm -hmm. So if you're holding it kind of like a tennis racket or something, you're gonna have to go over the ball. Well, when you're going for your classic pickleball grip, uh, separating your fingers actually creates a lot of trajectory and control of the paddle. So what I want with my grip is actually my index finger and my thumb to really support the paddle so that when I'm going under the ball, if you can kind of see the angle that I'm creating, that mm -hmm. index finger actually lifts the ball. Now the mistake that a lot of players make is they go in this position to try to hit it. And break that wrist. They break the wrist yeah. and it pulls it open. That's just a grip issue. Yeah. So when you're creating that spacing in your fingers, you're really directing that ball with your index finger and your thumb. Now what that does is it creates a nice consistent low to high motion. So if I want to hit a nice, uh, let's say drop shot versus a drive, now it's really about where my targets are. Okay? So I'm hitting a softer ball that's mm -hmm. going to be into the non-volley zone, uh, where basically if you're taking like a scale of one to 10 swing speed, mm -hmm. or maybe a two, you know, it's like yeah. a long dink, you know, and that's the mistake that people right. make is they put too much action into that shot. So from here, I can really hit a nice low to high lifting from my legs. Now, if I want to hit a drive, now I'm going to go up to like a five or a six, mm -hmm. but it looks the same. So I'm right. still creating the same backswing and acceleration from that motion. So it's really lifting the ball from here, but it's getting your weight into the ball. Now, so the most important thing really is the grip, but the other thing is really about transferring your weight. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about that forward, whether it is a drop or a drive, you still need to load your weight and transfer back to front. Now, where often people make the mistake is they're really trying to get on that front foot. So a right-hander is really like, oh, I gotta get my left foot down and lift. Well, that lift actually comes from that back leg. Correct. So uh, instead of making these big actions back, it's more about getting 
that right leg down so that you're either going from your right leg and finishing on your left leg or you're going right to left and then lifting. So think of like a rhythm, mm -hmm. like one, two, and then three. And, f and from there, that momentum, what does that help you with as far as if you hit a good third shot drop, what does that help you with? So the benefit here is, you know, number one, I think when you're looking at a third shot drop, it's not the old school, I got to get to the yes, net factor. Correct. You're looking to create an attackable opportunity on the way to the net. Right. So when you've got that energy moving forward and your paddle is now here, now your paddle's like, hey, I'm looking for that ball. Now I see it and I can transition right into that next ball. Right. I can accelerate and attack, or I can just keep that decelerated motion, keep it soft. But you've got options because your weight's going forward and your paddle is in a more ready position instead of creating all this action where you've got to go right. across the body and it actually often pulls people backwards. Correct. So from the same spot, I can drop the ball or I can drive the ball. And it's almost like I like how you describe that where that paddle's coming forward and then it's almost like that paddle turns into your radar and now you're here and you hit that and now it's in front and you're like, okay, now it's here and now if that ball is popped up, I can come forward and put that ball away. Exactly. One of the more important things in pickleball to recognize is how you finish one shot, it goes right into the next shot. We right. don't always have time to hit the ball and get ready. It's often, hey, I'm ready and now I'm looking and then I'm going right into that next shot. It's all about that preparation, the acceleration. And, and you know, one big key word in pickleball, explosiveness. I got to mm -hmm. explode, load my legs and lift from here. So, you know, when you're looking at your basic top spin motion, there's two things that you really need to create top spin. And mm -hmm. it's contact on the ball, mm -hmm. which is gonna be your low to high. Correct. But it's also gonna be the lifting of your legs. So yeah. it's not all about your paddle. It's a full body motion that creates consistency uh, and a regular point of contact out in front that creates a lot of disguise. Sarah, talk to us a little bit about when we're hitting these third shot drops and third shot drives, uh, trajectory and placement over the net. So, you know, the one thing I think I feel really strongly about, we focus way too much on trying to get it a specific height or an apex. That's mm -hmm. like one of the old, you know, questions that we hear. What's the apex of the ball? Well, the right. reality is, you know, the third shot drop and drive, they're much more offensive now. So the apex, it, it's really, it's, it's barely going over the net, just like a dink. You know, a, a drive and a drop is essentially the same kind of apex. It's mm -hmm. just the speed of the ball and where they bounce on the court. So obviously with the third shot drop, we want it you know, within the non-volley zone. Um, ideally, the more offensive is what we're looking at. Getting that ball maybe cross court to the outside of the court creates a lot of opening on the court. And then when you're driving the ball, now you're going to the back of the court, maybe down the middle or down the line. So essentially, they're gonna again, look the same over the net. We don't need to hit those big old apex right. because what that means is a slow ball and it bounces high. So what that means for our opponents, it's an attackable ball now. Right. We don't want them to be as offensive on the third shots like how we used to be when those balls were nice and slow. We would just let that ball bounce up and now hit a drive up high. Now we're really forcing our opponents to hit them down low uh, and create a pop-up or create an opportunity on the way to the net. So it's a really important thing to think about. You know, keep it, keep it similar, keep it simple. Think about your targets on the other side of the court. Right, that's great. And it's a great point because what it does is like you said, it turns that shot, that third shot drop or third shot drive, it turns it into an offensive shot rather than a, I just want to get me over shot. And it puts pressure on them where that ball's landing deep into the kitchen or like we talk about, just beyond the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And what's just beyond the kitchen? Their feet. Exactly. And so you're hitting their feet, hitting balls at their feet. That makes a, makes for a lot of mistakes. I think I, I try to encourage my students as often as possible. Every ball you hit should create pressure. There's not one ball mm -hmm. that's about, I got to get somewhere. It's not about the destination of the, of the non-volley line. It's about yeah. how you get there. What are you doing on the way to the destination? You're creating offense, you're creating opportunity. And like you said, pressure. Absolutely. That's great. And you said that. That's pressure. You said that. <laughs> more because, importantly. But more importantly, exactly. But that's what I want to kind of reiterate to all you guys out there is that put pressure on your opponents. Don't let them dictate play. You dictate play. You put that pressure on them. That's going to put you in the driver's seat for the point. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, those are some great tips and huge tips from Sarah. Thank you so much for explaining that. That is such a good breakdown for you guys at home and for even me right here. Just I'm picking up so much as listening to every little tidbit that Sarah just gave us. So thank you very much. Absolutely. It's the funnest shot in pickleball, right? That's right.
Sarah, thank you so much for being out here with us today. We really appreciate all your insight into everything. Um, Had a great time as always. Can't wait till next time. Awesome. So we are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back one on one. Me and Sarah, we're going to be talking all things pickleball. So don't go far. All right, guys, welcome back. I have Sarah Ansbury sitting down with me now. We're off court. We just got done with our great third shot drop lesson. Sarah, thank you so much. Absolutely, we had a lot of fun out there. Absolutely, we did, we did. Um, so now we're gonna get to know Sarah a little better. Um, we're gonna talk a lot of pickleball, mainly only pickleball. Um, but the first question I always like to ask is, to everybody on the show is, how did you get started in pickleball, Sarah? When did it start? Um, so I think I kind of fell into pickleball like a lot of us. I think it was about 2014 is what we were talking about yesterday. Yeah. So it's been longer than uh, than I probably like to think. You know, the funny thing is I was a tennis pro and mm -hmm. um, I used to run a, you know, as a head pro at a club out in Vancouver, Washington. So I'm from mm -hmm. Portland. Yep. And um, and some of our members had started playing pickleball on and there was three basketball courts. Okay. Uh, and so what they had started doing was the local pickleball club had started playing in the gym all the time. And so some of the members kept having me come over and I played a little bit, uh, but I was, still wasn't really like into it because it was different. And uh, they had a tournament that like, I don't know, like a month later. And so they talked me into playing the tournament. So a month after you started playing. Something like that, yeah. And I, I mean, I really didn't, still didn't know how to score. Like, I yeah. mean, I, I just didn't know anything about it. And um, I was running a tennis tournament at the same time. I was like, well, I'm there, <laughs> so I might as well. Uh, and so I played, and it, it was fine. It, you know, it was fun. But the the funny thing is, is a friend of mine from high school actually was playing, and um, and so she's kind of the one. She's like, like I need a partner for the next tournament, huh. and um, so you know, suddenly I was playing tournaments, and you know, I think that it was kind of random, but it worked out pretty well. I think that's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So what? Speaking of tournaments, what was your first big tournament that you played? that you can remember. So we're talking, I mean, I know it's a long time ago, but. Um, you know, I think it was actually TOC. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was TOC, so it must have been September in Utah. And, um, you know, I, it, it was a uh, no expectations because it was literally like a, maybe two months later or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And I was playing with a guy from back home and we lost our first round in the mixed doubles. Uh, and then, came all the way back to the final and had a great match in the final and um and then I won singles the next day and it, so you know it was a good event for me it was a lot of fun uh but I haven't been able to play with that friend since then and he's you know he's a great guy he's a yeah. senior player now so it's like you know but it was just kind of cool uh it, how much he rallied and I had a lot a lot of fun just yeah. with the back draw you know and coming back in and having that kind of experience yeah and now that that big tournament experience right there does that kind of does that give you that bug that like put it in you and, and saying like I really want to take this to the next level? Yeah, you know I, um, I I competed in tennis and I was still competing in tennis actually yeah. when I was playing pickleball and um, you know I think actually so that was September like a month later my five o like five five team went to nationals in mm -hmm. um, or even actually at the end of that month or something yeah and um, and we did really well I think we got like you know second place at nationals and. Um, and it was just kind of like a right time. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something different. Cause I keep, you know, tennis has kind of been the same for a very long time mm -hmm. and it just kind of worked out. Nationals for pickleball was like yeah. the next month. And, um, I think I won nationals, um, with like no expectations or something like that. And yeah. it was, so it was fun. It's just, you know, I think a lot of us compete in, in different sports or we're used to competing yeah. for a lot of us. And this was, it was different. It was a different way of competing, and it was, I think it was a little more exciting because it was newer. Yeah. You know, when you've been playing tennis since you were four years old, and, you know, you come into pickleball, and it's it's refreshing a it, little bit. It is, and, I, and I, I feel you. You know, me coming from baseball, and then all of a sudden you, you stop playing, and then it's like, 
where's that competitiveness? And then yeah. all of a sudden I found pickleball and then found tournaments and yeah. it was like that competitiveness and competitive side kind of drives you. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about where you, uh, your story, you go from Oregon, right? Yeah. And then you go RVing, you're across the country, you guys, and then all of a sudden where you land now. What is that story and how has that been from all the way out on the West Coast to now all the way settled at, in Hilton Head, South Carolina? You know, it's quite quite the experience, I'd have to say. Um, you know, I was still teaching tennis back home and, you know, I went, to, I think it was to the US Open. I spent like a month in Florida mm -hmm. and um, and I had some people pushing me like, you really need to go full time pickleball. And I was like, well, you know, you know, how do you do that? And, right. you know, I, I had these women that really helped me you know, set things up. I got like, you know, my website encouraged me to do a blog and, and yeah. do all that kind of stuff. And I came home and um, my wife picked me up at the airport and, you know, things were crazy. And um, she was like, I think, you know, we need to, we need to talk. And, um, <laughs> and it turns out that our friends had called my wife and said, L listen, you really like Sarah needs to do this. And, um, and so Lynn had said, all right, you've got to do this and I'll do it with you. And um, so we decided to see how pickleball was all over. We got an RV like the next week yep. or something. And um, we basically went all over the country um, teaching pickleball, playing pickleball. And uh, you know, always the goal was let's find out what needs to happen in pickleball mm -hmm. and let's see how it's working all over the country. And it was a lot about learning, you know, yeah. what, what do we need in pickleball? And so that when we found a place that we wanted to stay, mm -hmm. that we knew what we needed. Yeah. And, uh, and it was the same thing. I had no intention of moving to Hilton Head. Uh, my wife really didn't want to move to <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're West Coasters. Right. We were thinking about going back to California, actually. And um, I met with um, the director of the facility, Palmetto Dunes, that I'm at. And you know, we had a great conversation and it turns out he had been following me for years. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you the, the question that hooked me was where are your dogs? And yeah. I was like, can I bring my dogs here? Yep. And he's like, absolutely. They're welcome. I was like, Hmm. And then I was like, well, can you build more courts? And he's like, if you stay, we can build more courts. <laughs> and, um, and so that's it. We were like, this is the place. This is where we want to be. This is what, um, we can make our pickleball home and, and make a, a, a great facility where people want to come and play pickleball. And and that's awesome. And just to give him a shout out, this John Kerr. John Kerr. Uh, yeah. I love him. John's so one of the nice guys out there. And for you, he was a yes man and, and he was. to get you there. So <laughs> He was a yes man that got it done, yeah, I should say. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So we appreciate it and thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot, Dom. All right, we'll see you guys next time.